It has already been said that 40 people per minute attend an emergency department in the UK, and that means that we have enormous issues around scale. It drives me mad when people say it's very complex. It's not very complex, okay? That doesn't mean to say it's easy. It boils down largely to demand, capacity and output. So if we look at attendances in England, just in England, so last year there was a 371,864 person increase, which is quite a lot of people. Uh, and uh, to put that in context, that's about six, seven large emergency departments. Depending on your take and which side of the microphone you are on the Today programme, you can say it's a 2.6% rise, or you can say, well, we've seen over a third of a million extra people. Both are true. The year-on-year -year rise actually is not that much different to the change in the population base, so most of this is, uh, uh, is uh, expected and can be indeed predicted. So let's look at capacity. So we have about 1,850 trained emergency medicine doctors. That would be consultants and registrars in their last three years of training. In the last five years, 510 trainees have emigrated to Australia and New Zealand, and 110 consultants have similarly emigrated. If you add that figure together, that's 620, so a third of our workforce has gone. So it's absolutely imperative that whatever we do around how we reconfigure emergency care, whatever we do about contracts, whatever we do about messaging, we don't discourage even more people from staying and working in our system. We spend a lot of money training these people. Each of those people cost about half a million pounds to train. And they now pay taxes to a different government. For the Australasian government, this is the most efficient way to develop a highly experienced and effective workforce. And if it was up to me, I would simply introduce deportation for minor <laughs> parking fines in Australia, uh, and we could reverse the process. But their government isn't so keen. This irrevocable loss of capacity, do these people we've lost, if we just count the registrars, if they saw 2,000 patients a year each, which is a very modest number, we've lost the capacity to see three quarters of a million patients. So people say we haven't got the money to sort this out. Well, this is clearly nonsense. Um, we spend, if you've got an average A&E department, it costs six and a half million pounds to run per year. That's every doctor, nurse, receptionist, curtain, cup of coffee, tube of propofol, monitor, the lot. That's six and a half million. Every week, every week, we spend three million pounds on A&E locums in England alone. So every fortnight, we spend on locums what it costs to run an emergency department for a year. So the idea that we can't afford to sort it out is absurd. We must sort it out because we can't afford not to. Finally, looking at output. So the overnight bed availability has gone down and down and down. The occupancy has gone up and up and up. And one of the reasons for that is a good news story, actually, but becoming much more productive as a healthcare system. And so this is the number of elective <laughs> procedures carried out <coughs> over the last four years. And you can see there's a substantial rise with over a quarter of a million, quarter of a million more patients per year receiving elective care in our hospitals. But there are some other more or, or less, less positive reasons why we actually are having capacity problems. And this is the number of acute days lost due to delayed transfers of care. And you can see that, again, over the last four years, that's risen from 60,000 to almost 100,000 acute bed days lost. So it's actually getting worse. Unfortunately, this is the four-hour performance. And you can see that uh, we doubled the number of people, really, that breached the four-hour target in 2014-15. So my argument is that emergency medicine can no longer be A&E medicine. And what I see is an A&E hub an emergency department is a subsection of that together with acute out-of-hours primary care services, which would include mental health, general practice, community pharmacy, district nursing, etc., etc., as well as the minor injury units. And therefore, we can pull in other staff, other key members of the, uh, the medical, nursing and allied professions who are actually in a better position and have better skills to deal with the problems that many patients not unreasonably present to an A&E department with, but for whom emergency medicine doctors have only a limited scope of expertise to deal with. And I think patients have the right to expect to be treated in a streamlined way. I think patients with post-operative complications shouldn't be hanging around waiting for me. They should be going back to the surgical team that dealt with them. I think that people who only went home a few hours ago from the cardiology ward or the medical admissions unit don't need to wait around for me to say, oh, you're back. I'll fill in this form and another form and make 14 pointless phone calls and eventually you'll end up more or less where you started. I think they should go back where they came from. They've already seen a hospital doctor in a clinic. Well, don't refer them via the A&E department. 
consume your own smoke, find a bed for them. What really annoys me is when people get sent down from a cardiology clinic because they're waiting to see the cardiologist and they've had some palpitations and so somebody's brought them to the A&E department. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, and finally, as a take-home message, this is a great document, Safer, Faster, Better. I would urge everybody in the room to take a look at it before this winter. Many thanks.